uh, I'll be a bit rambly here and try to address the question which has been slightly been uh, uh, you know put into uh, confused uh, by people like Prabir uh, by uh, saying that there's a deliberate attempt to confuse people whereby these words have been invented. Anyways, uh, more seriously, I mean, I try to stick to governing globality and whether uh, the democracy will stand up to the occasion. And I'll try to speak in two parts, one on trying to see how globality is being governed right now and being attempted to be governed, and second, the more exploratory um, question and quest of what democracy stand up to the occasion. Um, yesterday, we uh, I said at one moment that network is just a metaphor for the market, and there were discussions perhaps uh, around that. And uh, today, I would uh, start with how network is the metaphor for governance and for democracy, actually. Network as governance and network as democracy. Um, there's one paper written two years back. Uh, the author, one of the authors is the president of Internet Society, who the people who know about it uh, may know that it's the umbrella organization of that problematic techie uh, which we were discussing just now. Uh, it says one of the most extraordinary outcomes of the digital revolution is that multi-stakeholder networks rather than state-based institutions now govern important global resources. And one of the most important of these governance networks is the Internet itself. I mean, literally, uh, the network as governance, which is curated, orchestrated, and otherwise governed by what at one time would have been an unthinkable collection of individuals, civil society organizations, and corporations with the ta tacit and, in some cases, active support of nation states. But no government, country, corporation, or state-based institution controls it. Internet has achieved its legitimacy, inclusiveness, and consensus-oriented decision-making. Uh, has achieved legitimacy. Internet has achieved its legitimacy and inclusiveness. It has achieved inclusiveness. And the subject matter of our workshop. Uh, and uh, it has come through consensus-oriented decision-making. Uh, so this is very central to what is happening uh, in governing globality. And I would, uh, disc I would use the case study of one organization which is at the heart of governing the Internet and how uh, it gets governed, and Alex has been pointing out uh, to it. Uh, I think uh, we, we were talking about really deep uh, structural issues, and on that matter, I am an active activist, and I agree with uh, Alison that we try to do what is needed today, including sitting in government offices and trying to influence that particular document. Most of my time gets spent there, uh, but not to see these larger changes would be a mistake because changes are really, really deep, and. They are both at theoretical level and at practical level. I will talk about the practical level of how governance gets taken place. But at a theoretical level, we are the social contract itself as a basis of our political institutions is challenged. And it is assumed that we don't need any social contract anymore because it is the hyper-connectivity and the hyper-expressivity of the internet on which we daily negotiate our social contract. And that negotiation is the basis of our governance. And if you go through many discussions on internet governance, you would have regular um, expressions which say these kinds of things, that politics uh, is a bad word. Uh, since all are connected, we are together, and we are able to figure out what needs to be done, and, and that's enough. And, uh, and for them, actually, connected is inclusion. I mean, we were talking from a practice viewpoint, Michael's community informatics uh, presentation and others that, you know, connectivity is not inclusion. But here is a theoretical issue. For them, connectivity is inclusion because there's nothing else they're going to do. Uh, there's no redistributive policies, for example. And anything else requires certain kind of redistribution and institutions of, uh, as Prabir was saying, nation state presently. Maybe there's something else. But redistribution is not a part. So connectivity is inclusion for them. And that's not uh, because we have not been able to do enough. Theoretically, that's it. Connected is included. Uh, and so we, we are talking about uh, you know, governing the globality in this ma manner. And going to how really things work out, uh, you may know, many of you may know, that there is this um, Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, 
which is at the heart of the governance of the internet. Many things which Alex has been talking is about how governance takes place there. But it's a very good case study of a new form of governance. And what's very interesting is that actually ICANN does some very unimportant things. They, they do things which if it was the government of India's work, there would be a I mean, small two room somewhere where an assistant director would have been sitting and having a set of directories where he'll just make sure that the servers are working and the direction of the uh, routing systems is, is guided by a certain directories. Basically, maintaining a telephone directory for the world is not that huge a task as people make out. But you keep on hearing about ICANN again and again and again. And a lot of people think internet governance is ICANN. Now, why an organization which is so inconsequential largely in its work gets to be spoken so much about and the reason is that it is governed by a model which is being developed as the model of governing the globality or, or the future future world and this model is best uh, represented in the way the ICANN is governed. Uh, I read out uh, how it is being made out as if internet is so unique and therefore a certain governance structure unique to it is being proposed. Uh, however, all the things which I read out in the quotation earlier comes from World Economic Forum reports which predate these reports and do not mention internet at all. So everything about multi-stakeholderism, uh, about soft law, about voluntary systems, all these things which are now imposed as some necessary condition of governing the internet as if it is associated with certain qualities of the internet are formulated somewhere else. And that, that's a larger global design. Actually, there is a, a report of the World Economic Forum called uh, Global Redesign Initiative uh, in which uh, all these formulations have been made. And they have been important in the area of internet governance because it's an uh, unoccupied space. Uh, and, and then it's been thrust on it as if it's something very basic to internet and to a new form of network society. So how, you know, finding an empty uh, theoretical space uh, which network society theory is in many ways uh, can be a way uh, in which uh, some dominant ideologies capture uh, space in, in that uh, sense we need therefore also the theory building or the field building becomes important uh, in this area. Um, in uh, ICANN's governance terms like public interest are openly scoffed. Politics is considered a bad word. They think that technical protocols and private contracts are enough uh, to do governance. Uh, governance is done through a network where people can talk with each other, they can negotiate positions like a market. It's actually governance is a market because people negotiate their positions and then they get a best position uh, which is then uh, perpetuated. Uh, they are a lot of inequalities in within this market of governance as well, but what I'm trying to say is there is a market paradigm imposed on governance uh, which is perpetuated. And uh, uh, if I read a quotation, or okay, I'll paraphrase it. The, the Global Redesign Initiative uh, report of World Economic Forum actually says that when it is internet, governance should be done by multi-stakeholder organizations. Uh, whether it's privacy, net neutrality, etc., it is somehow inherent that internet should be governed by multi-stakeholder governance organizations, which basically means that corporates have a veto on any global policy making. And in a little paragraph, this idea is reversed. And they actually admit that the governance of the internet in certain manner is a pathway to governance of all social systems, where they actually say as digitization proceeds in every social sector, the multi-stakeholder institution will become default. Uh, so, so they basically first said that something is inherent to the internet and therefore it has to be governed in certain manner, but a later part of the report actually admits that it's simply a pathway to have a new system of governance everywhere in the world. So it's not, and, and we uh, intellectuals, academicians have started to believe that there's something in the internet and in the network society which requires some new forms of governance. And I. I'm not for a moment saying that things have not fundamentally changed, and I'll come to that later, but they are not changed in the manner which is being expressed as has been changed, but this has been seen as an opportunity 
to bring on ideologies which have nothing to do uh, with either the internet or the network society. It's simply an ideology of domination uh, which uh, is using uh, opportune moment uh, to come in and most of the researchers of this area, uh, I dare say, are not really uh, quite, uh, quite aware of uh, uh, this macro uh, happening. Uh, okay, uh, how many minutes am I left with? Uh, so, so we can discuss that and I think this would merit some discussion about how governance of this system is taking place. And the same report also says uh, that conflict-ridden states should be governed uh, by states and corporations together. Uh, that they explicitly say that and tomorrow the conflict uh, region state would be the northeast of India or Kashmir uh, which also should be therefore governed by corporations together so the, the real headway being made uh, through a certain kind of governance thinking which and I'll come back to it again has been uh, riding on a certain kind of cultural sentiment which I call a part of globality uh, of which a major instrument is the civil society and that's where our re responsibility as civil society and intellectuals come and I would focus a lot on, on that part of it. Uh, though the, the, uh, it, is, it is a conspiracy of the powerful uh, corporations, the richest classes, however the legitimacy of this, this, this system is given by civil society. There's a certain new I think the globality is something which is beyond economic globalization, something when it's economic, cultural, as, as a complete uh, integrated social phenomenon uh, which is now happening and that phenomenon is most represented and in a certain class to which fortunately or unfortunately we all belong, uh, which sees its cultural expression and fulfillment in certain thinking, uh, which scoffs at many of those ideologies and philosophical underpinnings uh, which provide the basis of a nation state and old state politics. And this, uh, this, uh, this is not that clearly seen most of the times and therefore never negotiated. And therefore uh, it is mostly the civil society, the global civil society groups uh, that have given legitimacy to a new form of governance. Uh, they don't derive the greatest benefit from it, uh, but they legitimize it. And therefore the very withdrawal of that legitimacy is going to weaken the whole system a lot. It would be very clear if we withdraw the legitimacy that it is a coalition of the most powerful doing what the powerful have always done. And it is the civil society's thin cover to it which gives a lot of legitimacy and I think which we need uh, to address. Uh, now looking at what should be done and whether the democracy would stand up uh, is, is a very difficult uh, question, but uh, whether in our lifetimes or not, I think we have left with no other option than to try to do something. Uh, and I, th I would divide it in two parts. One, what we need to do immediately and what is the longer arc of history and the longer march of history. And when we talk about what needs to be immediately at the global level, and I think UN uh, is one that one such maligned organization that even if uh, Prabir has to even mention UN, he has to put a proviso that UN is not perfect because we are forced to say it every time we mention US because that's a force of culture, the force of ideology which is imposed on this particular class that you cannot mention UN uh, without saying of course it's not perfect. But I really think about it and I challenge you guys to tell me that when did UN last did a really bad thing? Can you give me an example? UN did something really bad. Yes, yeah. Nadim. Okay. Uh, security. That's what it could not do. That's what it could not do. Stop the war in Gaza. But he's asking for a positive example. What does it do? With <laughs> yeah. That's a failure of the uh, UN system and Security Council is a aberration on what we criticize as the UN system. So of course, and also tell me what institution, we are talking about the macro institutions which have not done bad, the American government, the Indian government, the Dutch government or, or the Indian civil society or I mean, uh, so again Prabir is right, uh, even in the area of internet with all this multi-stakeholderism, the best resolution on privacy is a resolution from the Human Rights Council. And none of the multi-stakeholder bodies over the last 15 years have even come close to that language and the last one failed even after the best attempt to even reach that language. So the point is that United Nations have so many checks and balances by the very fact that the US, India, China, all are there that 
is very difficult to do something really, really bad. But the point is that we are used to say that UN has to be considered bad for some reason. And this is an imposition which we all suffer and we are not able to resist at all. So I think in the short term we need to recognize that as we look at the structural changes, and I really believe, and that's why we coined these words, globality, etc., etc., and our name is IT for change, and we are not uh, skeptics, nor we think that the, the direction and the momentum and the quantity of change, quality of change is less. We think it's epochal. Uh, okay. uh, what's happening is, is huge. Uh, we probably overestimate it as an organization, so I'm not saying that things are not changing, but that doesn't mean that you know we, we, we just lose perspective. And therefore, if we have to do politics and the democracy has to stand up, it has to first take note of what we have in our hand and work with it. And I think protecting UN systems in also the governance of the network society is the biggest challenge which the middle class, the intellectual class, has completely abandoned uh, for reasons which if I had time I would still go into. While we do this, I think we have this longer thing. We know that there is actually a certain globalization, globalness, globality happening, which is not necessarily a bad thing. And we have to adjust our uh, systems thinking and governance uh, institutions to it. So please do that. And, and, and we should go ahead in doing that. And where do I see hope coming? It's, it's a very difficult exploration, but I think the new democracy movements which are springing up in some tentative manners in most parts of the world, I'm starting to see some picture in connecting those dots. And I see some future there for a new kind of a democracy assertion uh, in, 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 the, in different parts of the world. Uh, I wouldn't go into that because it's, it's a long, long discussion. Uh, however, that itself would not uh, really mean good global governance because even a good national government is not, it doesn't, I mean, uh, people have self-interest at their heart. Even the best of the governments would, coming out of the best of the movements, would have that self-interest. And therefore, we need some layer of global governance which is different. I'm not sure where it's going to come from, but I think uh, as new democracy movements grow, uh, there will be reclaiming of certain values. I think now it's a fight we have to fight at the cultural level. Political was the one I'm talking about, but it's deeper now. At the cultural level, we have to reclaim certain principles of our collective living. Uh, and as new democracy movements come in certain parts of the world, we hope those reclamation of principles take place, which could form a global normative and ideological space in which certain forward-looking movements could take place. And I really liked what Anita said in the first day, that nature and culture are prior. And yes, I have no doubt about what culture does to people. I'm seeing culture as the way of our doing things. All of us are, us, not the dominant cultures, but culture as such. Culture and nature is uh, claimed as prior to economics and military initiatives. So I think there, there are certain cultural ideological principles which would come up. And again, the leadership has to be provided in any big change by the bourgeois class. You, we know that. Uh, we may be the dis, uh, unrooted uh, groups, but this is the intellectual class and the, and, the, and the civil society classes which would start formulating those frameworks which would provide the basis of new global governance systems. And in this respect, I think our research agendas uh, should be adequate to that particular task because this is a deep cultural ideological uh, fight in the end and and we have to be operating at that level so i hope our research agendas which come out of this uh, meeting today uh, does describe this particular task of inclusion in the network society as a political task uh, but also as an ideological cultural issue and our research questions uh, start exploring those areas thank you <laughs>